Why don't you give me a sign? This is Corinna Jane. That leaves a trail along that shore. It's not your problem, it's mine. With her brand new single, Give Me a Sign. As featured on BBC Introducing. It's just the way it's gotta be. Corinna Jane, give me a sign. Out now. Is that your promise, man? I know most people don't think about us up there in the mountains. Many of my patients are miners. It's dangerous work, and they carry the burden of building this nation on their backs. They're in pain. Hello, I'm Sophia Jessica, and welcome to the Fan Carpet. So this show, so in 2017, there was a New Yorker article uh, by Patrick Radin Keefe. My boyfriend. Your boyfriend. <laughs> uh, who, uh, and in this article, he laid out that uh, the opioid crisis all stemmed from one company that was micromanaged by one family. And, and it was this really brutal expose on the Sackler family and how that they were basically responsible for the opioid crisis and, and how they did it. And, it. and it was a pretty shocking story because there was um, uh, the lies, deception, the criminal behavior was, was laid out. And that blew the Sacklers up into a major news story. That's when uh, then Nan Golden started doing protests, bring their names off of the museums. Uh, I think there was a major one of those protests here that she did. And um, so a producer came to me, John Goldwyn, a really wonderful producer, and he said, um, do you want to write and direct a movie on the Sackler family? And this was a few months later, and I'd read the article but hadn't thought about it as, as, for, you know, as a story. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. Why don't I kind of start diving into this? And there had been two books written about, um, about you know, the opioid crisis, Purdue Pharma, the Sackler family. It was really laid out. And the more I read about it, the more I was stunned, shocked, could not believe the level of deception, lies, dishonesty, uh, criminal behavior. Uh, it, it was like the whole thing was a long con um, that was meticulously manipulated. Uh, by this company that was micromanaged by this family. And you know, for years the family said, oh, we're, we're just on the board, we're passive members. Uh, we're not even really involved in the company. And then in, I don't know, 2016, 17, uh, all their emails came out in discovery from all these lawsuits against them. And oh my God, so shocking. They were lying through their teeth. They were micromanaging this company. This was their company. Uh, the people that ha went down for an earlier uh, settlement uh, were like the second class citizens of the company. You know, it was not, it was, it, the whole thing was a lie. And then you start to realize, oh, everything about this company and this product, uh, how they marketed the product, it's all a lie. And it's shocking. It's just truly shocking. So then I thought, well, I got to do something with this. I don't know what, I don't know what, you know. And then I thought about the movie Traffic. And I thought, oh, maybe there's a version of Traffic of the opioid crisis where you could do different stories that, that intertwine. So, because I thought just the Sacklers, I don't know, lying rich people, you know, that are just a bunch of assholes. I don't know, I, I don't know, a movie maybe, but I, I just seemed, it didn't seem like there was enough story there. So, uh, so then I s realized there was this court case. Uh, I'm sorry, is this a super long answer? No, no, this is All right, great. well there was a court case where they, um, where a US attorney uh, and his prosecutors went after Purdue Pharma and they built a great case against them and the case settled in 2007. And I thought, oh, a case, prosecutors, that means there's an investigation. Ooh, that maybe that's the spine of this pea. That's when I started to see it as a work of, of art, if that doesn't sound pretentious. If it does, I apologize. Uh, but as a drama, as, as a scripted story. And then I kept researching, and then there was this DEA investigation in 2000, 2001. Oh my gosh, another investigation. Well, then I thought, okay, there's these exciting layers to this story. 
uh, that could expose their criminal behavior. And I thought, well, maybe we could be with them as we're watching them come up with these dishonest campaigns. So there's another interesting story. And then lastly, it was, well, you can't do this without doing the victims. Uh, and then the victims became this composite town I created called Finch Creek. Uh, that, that, that I, you know, had these characters that were composite characters that I saw as the archetypal uh, victims of the crimes of Purdue Pharma. So that was how, that was where it all began and, and sort of how the construction of it came. Yeah, so it was, it, this is sort of one of those unusual Hollywood stories, but not really that unusual. I had done, I don't know, a year's worth of research, had come up with the entire show which is the show that you see, Dope Sick, pitched it to the studio, 20th, which is part of the Disney family. They bought it. We were in the process of booking meetings to go pitch it around town. And then Fox 21, another studio under the same banner uh, under Disney, didn't know about that I was doing that. And they went and bought the book Dope Sick in a bidding war. Um, and I read about it on Deadline Hollywood. <laughs> so, well, that's interesting that my, my own studio has a rival project against me. Like, what, so what are we gonna do here? Um, and so I, uh, they, they, they were screwed because it can take six months to two years to find a writer to adapt a book. It's very, you know, I'm a producer as well and I, I hire writers to do, to do exactly that. And I, I've had projects where it's, it's literally taken two years to find the right writer. So, and I was ready to go. So they asked if I would team up. I read the book, Dope Sick. Uh, I loved the book, Dope Sick. And it was, it did something different than the other books. Because at this point now, there's been four books that have come out. And it did something different, which was that it covered the victims. It covered the people on the ground uh, that were struggling um, with opioid use disorder and, and all from the lies of Purdue, right? So, uh, and then I loved her even more, Beth. And she wanted to be in the writer's room. And I thought, oh, well, there wasn't going to be a writer's room. But, you know, she's, she's, uh, would be, it'd be great to do this with an expert. And maybe I'll hire one or two other writers. And, 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 and thus, we were off to the races. So Beth has been a wonderful part of the team. Um, but yeah, it is sort of strange that, you know, so, so why, how did you adapt Dope Sick? Well, I didn't really. Um, and part of why, one of the things that made me want to team up with them besides Beth and thinking, wow, this would be great to have her on board, was the title Dope Sick. I thought, what a great title. It's a great uh, title. And then a little bit later down the road, I got a call from someone saying, hey, they've tested the title and they don't like it. Would you change it? And I said, that's the whole point of me teaming up with them. This is a great title. Like, enough of the testing. This is a great title. And they were, they were awesome. They were like, okay, fine. <laughs> you know? They were, like, they were like, no worries, no worries. Just wanted to let you know that we tested it. <laughs> uh, so that was, uh, that's how that came to be. Mm. Yeah, it was, it was a very complicated piece. I had... Um, before I'd sold the show, I had outlined the whole season. Not beat by beat, but I had these broad stroke outlines because I wanted to know in my own head that I could pull it off and that, that I thought this could work before I even sold it to anyone. Um, so, so I had kind of, kind of sketched it out and had sort of the season sketched out. Um, and then uh, I, I was, it was originally at FX instead of Hulu. And they made me do a 10 page document on what the season would be. So there was so much work that had gone into it that by the time I started episode two, I had a strong sense of, of how it would work. Now that doesn't mean I didn't know it would work because uh, it's a complicated narrative device um, of having intertwining stories like this. You know, you could say it's complicated, although you know, in any TV show, there's intertwining stories, but normally they're all connected in some way. They're part of the same family or the same office, right? Where this is these different stories, but then to make things even harder, I, they took place in three different time periods. So now why did I do that? Well, the investigations 2002 to 2007, the per Purdue storyline, I, I had to do the origin story of the launch of Oxycontin, that's 1996. I have to show the victims, that's 1996. The DA investigation's 2000, right? So if I just did it linear, then that means the first six episodes would just be Purdue Farm and the victims. 
then then episode five, the DEA agent comes in, then episode seven, uh, episode seven, the prosecutors come in. Uh, that would have been a very bad television show. It wouldn't have worked. It literally wouldn't have worked. I mean, part of the this kind of uh, part of what makes the show so intense is is that the investigations happening. The investigations are happening simultaneously as they're committing the crimes and as we're watching the victims. So it, it really was the only way uh, that I believed the story could work. And I thought it could be pretty cool. And I'll be honest with you, any, uh, I've in the last two days it's aired in the US and I've had several writers reach out to me, friends and colleagues that have seen it. And they're all like, how the fuck did you do that at the time? It's unbelievable. You know, it's like the thing that writers are kind of most impressed with, because I there is a bit of a, there's some craftsmanship there, you know, like it was not easy to do, so uh, so that's been that's been lovely. I imagine lots of different colored note cards and a very big board. I wish it would have been, but there was a, a thing called a worldwide pandemic, so we had no writers' room, so we had to do it virtually. Oh so there was no, we had bought all the different cards, we bought all the boards, and then week two of the room, bam, shut down. So it was all virtual, and it was really interesting doing the room virtually. I, there was no board, which is fine by me because I was a screenwriter for a decade before I ever started writing television. So it's not like I need the board or I can't do this, you know? There was no board, and then I would get confused if I, if I found that I would get confused if I wasn't taking the notes. So I ended up being the showrunner and the writer's assistant because I was taking all the notes, and it was very confusing to people. They're, they're like, why are you taking the notes? And, and I'm like, this isn't because I'm trying to be humble, I'm just doing it because it's just to keep all this straight in my head, because it's very confusing. Um, and everyone in the room said, yeah, we know you're not trying to be humble. That we get, <laughs> that we get. Um, but it was, uh, it, was, it was just a, you know, you just go with what you got, so. Mm -mm. The show is basically 1996 to 2007. So I wasn't worried about everything that was happening now. The only thing I was worried about was how am I gonna end the show? What piece of information, because I, I knew that there would be some sort of catch up for the audience to end the season in some way, whether it's the Chirons you see or something else and I, uh, decided I didn't want to do the Chirons because I wanted to do something that felt maybe a little more creative, but I'm not going to tell you because it hasn't <laughs> aired yet. And, but, but so, and it, by the way, it's not this most genius thing I did, but it was just something that was a little more interesting, I thought, to do that. But it was, so where is that going to end? Uh, and the ending came three weeks ago with the, with the, with the bankruptcy ruling. Um, so that's how, that's how the season ends with that, with that piece of information which in many ways might be the end of the story. I hope not. I do hope there's a criminal investigation into the Sackler family um, uh, because it's, it's, uh, I can't believe that Richard Sackler hasn't been charged for crimes. Um, and, and it's so funny, you say the Sackler family and it's more like six people that, that really did this and three of them are no longer with us. Um, and uh, so there's maybe three people that are living that are, that, that are really responsible for this. But Richard Sackler was the godfather of Oxycontin. He's, mm. he's, 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 he's really the main person. Mm. Um, but one of the things I love about the show is of course you focus on the Sacklers, but it's not a case of just a few bad apples cause this thing. Like there are, these are deep systemic problems as well. And I love the way that the show really. You mean with the U.S. That. government? It, absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah. So well, and also uh, in 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 our show, it ends with the 2007 settlement these, of this the case that these prosecutors that we follow put together, and um, they were um, they put an incredible case together and they showed their criminal behavior and and they wanted to charge key executives with felonies, and then that didn't happen. And that not happening is kind of how Purdue Pharma got away with it in this phase, right? Like the, the law was on to them, you know, and they started a case and then, and then it slipped away. And how it slipped away is completely fascinating. 
and it ties into the bigger story that you just mentioned, which is uh, moneyed influence at the highest levels of the U.S. government. In some ways, it's like it's it's legal bribery, you know. Uh, and there's this systemic problem we have in the U.S. called the revolving door, which is that people in government agencies that regulate private industry they leave the government and they immediately go get a job working for the company that they were just regulating. And the problem with that is it creates a conflict of interest that they may not properly regulate them because they are maybe seeking a job. So I'm gonna give you a spoiler from the first episode. But one of the reasons why the entire opioid crisis happened was because the FDA granted Purdue Pharma this very unusual wording on the warning label of OxyContin, which said, and I'm not even gonna say verbatim because it's too confused, it doesn't even make sense to be honest with you, um, but it basically said that the drug OxyContin was less addictive than other opioids. Um, and, and so that wording was the primary sales tool for, for sales reps <laughs> when they met with doctors. It was, the FDA has a warning label that says it's less addictive. This is, this is a breakthrough in pain management, right? Well, it was not less addictive. It was just as addictive. It's pure heroin in a pill, right? It, in some cases, it's more addictive because it's pure oxycodone as opposed to Vicodin, which is cut with aspirin or Tylenol and you know, Wartap, these other drugs, they're cut with something else. Not Oxycontin, it's pure oxycodone. It's pure opium, right? So the guy that wrote, that approved the warning label at the FDA, he approves the label, 18 months later, he goes to work for Purdue Pharma at five times the salary, right? So it is the most sort of like, uh, you know, biggest example of, of the revolve, the corruption of the revolving door. And, and the prosecutors opened the case on him. I mean, the appearance of corruption is so staggering um, 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 with, with, with what his actions were. So that's literally, we find that out in episode one. Um, and that's just the beginning of the lies and the corruption and the deceit. Um, but so sorry, I kind of ruined the, the season one. It's plenty more episodes. Plenty, plenty more episodes, <laughs> plenty more episodes. Yeah, well, so I, I won't pursue a true life story into a scripted, movie or limited series unless there's so much great stuff there that the truth will carry the piece right so it's like if you have to if you have to make up a bunch of stuff in order for the dynamic moments of the story to work just do something else you know or do something that's from 200 years ago that hopefully no one will call you on you know or it doesn't even matter that you're making stuff up right but but uh it, it's it's if you have to make up the things that are most important in the story then, then I think it's irresponsible and immoral to do that. Um, in the case of the dramatization that occurs, well, um, that dramatization is used as a conduit to get true facts out. So the stuff that you're making up is historically insignificant. It's not unfair to anyone. Uh, maybe you're tweaking things for, for drama to make it compelling and powerful or funny or whatever you're going for. But at the end of the day, all of that is in service of getting the truth out. Um, and, if, and if getting the truth out isn't good enough, then work on something else. Uh, because, you know, you're, you're just, you know, it's just, you're just a liar. Mm. <laughs> you know, I, I think that, I mean, I also, I have a, there's two kind of witness tests I have. One, which is um, that HBO, because the first two of these I did were for HBO. And the lawyer from HBO in two minutes kind of gave me a principle that guided me. If, it, if you're showing someone do something negative or that makes them look bad, it has to be true. If you're showing some, someone do something positive or neutral, it doesn't necessarily have to be true. <laughs> you know, it's, it's anything you do in a negative light has to be true. And then the other principle is my own principle which is I call uh, uh, the 10-year-old the Danny principle, which is if you're 10 years old and you find out that this moment is untrue and you're bummed, then maybe you, it doesn't work. 
You know, it's like, have you ever seen something and you're like, that's untrue? Oh, really? Oh, but that was such a big part of the story, you know? So that's the other kind of thing that, that guides me, are those, mm. those two. But, and then a lot of other things too, like, you know, fear of slander and libel. Yeah. But whatever, whatever, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Yeah, there's two main things I want people to take away. I, I wanted to give the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma the trial that they never got because they haven't had a trial. They've had settlements in which they've pled guilty, the company's pled guilty to three felonies and nine billion dollars in fines. I mean, that's a guilty ass company, huh? You know, and, and the first time they pled guilty, it was to lying. Uh, now in America, everyone lies. So how badly do you have to lie that you have to plead guilty to a federal charge of lying? I mean, that's, that's pretty profound. Um, so, so one is to lay out their crimes for the country so that there is this historical record document of what exactly Purdue Pharma did so that the victims of Purdue that are still alive and the family members of the victims know what happened. And then, and not only that, but what I've seen on Twitter in the last two days is they're not, they're not just ecstatic that their family members know what happened, but it's so that the country knows what happened to them. You know, I'm seeing like people are gonna know what happened to me now. You know, I took, I took a pill for an injury and I lost six years of my life to addiction because you can become addicted. Oxycontin was so powerful, you could become addicted to it in three days. Three days, your brain chemistry is altered and you uh, will do anything in your power to uh, get your next fix because if you don't get it, you think you're gonna die, you're in so much pain. That condition is called being dope sick. And so that's, and that's, and literally, and it can take two years for your brain chemistry to be rewired back to normal. And that's after you stop taking the drug, right? So that's why people are not able to stop because it actually takes two years to be able to, 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 to fully recover if your frontal lobe has been damaged enough. And I think that amount of damage can happen in you know, months, uh, uh, just a few months. But so, so that's one. The other thing is that there are actually really effective treatments for opioid use disorder. Uh, buprenorphine, uh, which is known as Suboxone, um, it's, a, it's a prescription that you take daily, um, and it kills the, the withdrawals and the symptoms. Now, it's, it, it, it is a narcotic, but it's a much tamer, tamer doctor-prescribed narcotic that enables you to essentially have a normal life. Now, some people can't get off Suboxone, and they have to take it for the rest of their lives, which I think is better than being a heroin addict, uh, you know, living under a bridge, trying not to get dope sick, right? Although some people can get off Suboxone. Either way, um, it's incredibly effective, but it's highly stigmatized because there are people in the, in the recovery community that say, oh, you're just replacing one drug for another. Um, and only 12% of the people that need Suboxone actually take it. So it's like saying 12% uh, of people that need insulin for their diabetes uh, are actually getting insulin. Well, that's terrifying, right? And, and this, uh, so I'm hoping, and this is a major thing of what Beth Macy's goal of the show was, was to destigmatize Suboxone because it's such an effective treatment um, and, and one of the only treatments. Look, if you can, if you can stop taking Oxycontin or, or, or fentanyl or heroin um, without Suboxone, fantastic, you know? If you can control your diabetes through diet and exercise and not take insulin every day, Great, do that, you know? Uh, but if you can't, um, then, then this is uh, an incredible solution. And if we could double the amount of people that are, are getting it um, from the show, that's, that's incredible. But if we could get that number from 12% to 70%, that could turn the tide on the opioid crisis, which is still flourishing. Uh, so that, that's the other goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you all know Barry Levinson? Have you guys heard of him? Now, a lot of people haven't heard of Barry. Uh, um, they're younger, which is crazy, because when I was, you know, uh, a teenager into my 20s, you know, it, it, I wasn't in film school, but I cheated my way into film school as I was in the theater school. And I would say he was one of the heroes, filmmakers, of the 80s and the 90s and early aughts. He's 79 now, but he's directed 
all of these iconic classics, The Natural, Avalon, Rain Man, Oscar winner, Diner, uh, Wag the Dog. It's just kind of, it's, it's, it's an unbelievable filmography. Uh, and uh, in his last, in the last 10 years, he's been directing these HBO movies that are terrific. It's so inspiring. You can see directors like Barry and Mike Nichols and, and Clint Eastwood and, and Scorsese and Spielberg who are in their 80s and, uh, and Clint Eastwood's 91. They can still uh, they can still do it at the highest level. It's it's pretty it's pretty uh, inspiring to see that. And so um, I was so lucky that he wanted to direct the pilot and the episode two. I spent basically four months uh, attached to his waist with the two of us, you know, doing all this stuff together. And it was it was the greatest film school I could have ever asked for. I direct the last two episodes of the season, so to get to spend four months with Barry before I went to direct my two episodes uh, was something I'll always be grateful for. Uh, and we just we talked everything out together. You know, as far as the look goes, it was every meeting with the production designer and the cinematographer we would do together. And uh, I would on those issues, I would let Barry lead and then chime in and. And, you know, it would be a discussion, but um, the cinematographer, this guy Chekho Varese, really talented, knew exactly what he was doing. Our production designer did Heat and all the Spider-Man movies. I mean, it was amazing we got him to do a limited series, um, one of his first TV jobs. So it was a, it was a real A-team group of people. It was, it was, it was pretty amazing. So... Uh, the simple answer is we offered him the part and he said yes. <laughs> you know, that, I mean, that's what happened. I didn't, um, I never thought he would do it uh, because he hadn't done TV in 15 years um, since he's resurfaced as this sort of leading, one of the great dramatic actors. Um, and he also was an ensemble show. He's not the lead, there is no lead. Um, although he's kind of the main character, but it's an ensemble. And I thought, well, Michael Keaton's gonna, first time he's gonna do television, he's gonna be in an ensemble. Um, but it was our first, we hadn't offered any roles to anyone. So when you're making offers to actors, um, you, if you've been greenlit and you're making offers to actors, you don't wanna get too many passes. Because if you start racking up a lot of passes, the people that are financing it, they start to get nervous. Like, oh, talent doesn't want to do this? Is there something wrong with this? Um, so, so someone like Michael Keaton, I would only make that kind of offer maybe twice. And then I'd get scared and then go to a tier of actor that's not as famous and as in demand as him. Um, or unless Hulu, unless I would talk it out with Hulu and say, I don't want to get any more passes, and they'd say, we don't care about that. Just make one, you know, that, like you would have, you can have that conversation, right? But then I wouldn't fully believe them. I'd be like, yeah, but you get that third pass and are they gonna start freaking out? So, but it was the first offer. So it was like, okay, let's, let's, let's just try it. And then, and then he wanted to meet with me, which was amazing for me because he's another childhood hero. Um, I grew up on his comedies uh, when I was a kid. Uh, and he was literally one of my favorite actors. It was Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson were my two favorite actors when I was eight years old. Same height as I am now, it's crazy. But, um, and so it was just, uh, yeah. So it was really, uh, it was really thrilling. A, just to meet with him, and then B, and then he said yes. And he actually has a personal connection to this. Yeah, movie. which I didn't know, which is his nephew passed away from a fentanyl overdose. So this story was really personal to him. So um, I, I'll tell you this because he's already said this publicly, but I, um, I met with him, and it went good. He didn't say yes in the phone call, but he's he's he was clearly interested. And then I got a call that he wants um, a document of his arc for the rest of the season. So I wrote a five-page document of, of what happens to the character. And, um, and then I sent it off, and then he, a week later, he said he was in. Great. So then he gets episode four, which is a very big turn for the character that wildly affects the rest of the season. And he called me. And he said, what, what, what this, is, this is crazy, I, I, what? And I said, Michael, it's in the document. He said, well, I didn't read it. <laughs> um, so yeah, now, he's like, this is gonna be a lot of work. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, yeah, but it's gonna be great, it's gonna be great. He was like, okay, <laughs> you know? 
Yeah, so anyways, so that's how we got Michael Keaton. So, but in, now at this point, right, I've got this show, it's been greenlit, I've got Barry Levinson, legend, Michael Keaton, legend. Like, now we're good, you know? All that tension of, you know? Then we were off to the races, and then everyone wants to be in the show now. So you, so it's awesome, because it doesn't always go that way, you know? It doesn't always go that way. Well, I've already written it. So um, my background as actor is so funny, because when I first, my first two movies were these political dramas that I mentioned already. And, and I got attacked a lot by people that were trying to discredit the pieces, which were really, you know, incendiary pieces, very truthful, and people didn't like the truth being told in a mainstream way. So, by the way, not, it was a small group of people, but they would attack it, and they would always start the attack with, the actor from Buffy the Vampire Slayer <laughs> wrote this movie, and then sometimes it would be the actor from Gilmore Girls wrote, you know. So it was like the, it was like the attack line, sort of in the early part of my career, which by the way, never bothered me. My favorite was when someone attacked me and said, the actor from Buffy and the Vampire Slayers. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, I am one of those slayers. Um, but so it was, uh, so, but the truth was, is that my background as an actor um, which goes a little bit beyond those two shows, uh, is my secret weapon as a writer, director, producer. It's everything. It's literally everything. Uh, and, and the actors love it, you know, because I write the scenes to be played because I've spent 30 years playing scenes as an actor. So it's, it's literally so, and if you're not an actor and you're a writer, uh, I recommend taking some acting classes. A, it might be fun, and B, um, uh, who knows what you'll learn just from playing scenes, you know, as far as, as far as writing them. So, so it's literally, it's literally my biggest, my biggest asset in, in everything else I do is that my background's that. Um, I'd like a nap. Uh, I've got a, I don't know, I've got a full slate. I have a TV company now, so I'm producing lots of things that I'm not writing. So I want to focus on those for a little bit and try and get some shows made that I'm not writing so that I can be a non-writing EP like my non-writing EPs, which means someone else does all the work and then you step in a little bit uh, and take credit for all their work. It's kind of amazing. That's just an amazing thing. You collect thing. the Emmys. Yeah, yeah. I've just seen, I've seen that happen and I'm like, and by the way, I like my non-writing producers. They've been very helpful, but, but it's like the difference between that and that as far as just hours in a day is kind of staggering. So I'm like, well, that's a good gig. Let me try that. So I have a number of projects that I'm producing on that front. Uh, I have uh, a couple movies I'm going to write and then I've got a few TV show ideas and some, and, and some, I love limited series. I think this is the coolest form as an audience member and as a writer uh, to work on. I mean, it's just, it's just to get eight hours to, to, to do it as opposed to two is, is really great. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd like to do another one of those too. Sure, I mean, who wouldn't want to do something on Trump? Uh, but uh, so, yeah, so me and Jay Roach, the guy who did the first two political films, uh, who directed them, who's maybe the greatest guy ever. Um, we've been trying to figure out a Trump project for many years. And uh, um, it's just the problem, the really challenge of doing a Trump project is every day during that presidency and during that campaign, uh, every day with him made the previous day irrelevant because it was so chaotic, right? And it was as if, you know, I remember there was this book, Fire and Fury, that came out that was really entertaining to read. And, and Jay wanted to do that. He actually, I think he optioned it. And, and I said, you know, and so I read it right away and I loved it. And I said, yeah, but it's, it was irrelevant the day after it came out because so much crazy shit happened the day it came out. You know, that happened every day of the Trump administration. And I don't want to do something unless, unless I could do something that has something, um, I don't know if profound is the word to say, but something, something to say about the subject matter that is thematic, that is much bigger than the events themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's just doing the events, well, that's, that's a documentary or that's a news story even, not even really a documentary, that's more, that's more of a news story, the events, right? So my whole thing is, is 
what does this say? What are, what, what's a theme, an idea that is much bigger that you want to say? And sometimes you can't go do that right away. You need time away from it. You need reflection, you know? Um, I remember that on the Mueller investigation, for we were following that, and we're like, we're gonna do the Mueller investigation, right? So then the Mueller investigation comes out, and it's, it's a weird, you know, he's not really exonerated, but they said he is, but not on this part, but this part too now, you know? And, um, and I thought, well, maybe there's still something here, you know, that, that has something profound to say. And then literally the next day, he commits impeachable crimes. <laughs> You know, I mean, it was like, and it's impeached. So who cares about that? He's now been impeached, you know, with Ukraine. So, and that's the, that's the, that's the Donald Trump story, right? It's, it's just, how do you keep up with it? And that's actually part of his, a uh, little bit of his success, which isn't intentional, is that there's so much insanity. It's hard to kind of nail him on something because uh, there's, it's too much stuff happening. Mm. Yeah. I say it with love. Thank you for watching The Fan Carpet. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for more content next time. I think I can make this the biggest drug in the world. on the largest of the Balearic Islands, Mallorca. With the turquoise waters of the Mediterranean Sea, beautiful mountainous landscape, the thriving city of Palma, quaint little market towns, a growing number of luxury hotels, it's no surprise that the likes of Audrey Hepburn and Elizabeth Taylor like to holiday here. So come and join me as I take you round Mallorca. Thank you for watching the fan carpet. If you like this video, be sure to click that thumbs up button at the bottom of your screen. And also be sure to subscribe to the fan carpet YouTube channels. They're absolutely free. That's so much fun too. Be sure to check out the official website, thefancarpet.com. Also, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay up to date with reviews, competitions, the latest news, and so much more.